Smith, who's been doing the UK stuff on Brexit. Mm -hmm. If you see the names, you see the names of Raj Patel, I sit between next to both of those. I was on that team for a year, and then I worked at Bank of America as an FX trader. So on the sell side, so that's a, what, my background. I've been at Amplify nearly a year now, but focus way more on the university and CPD side. I'm when I go to university and do a careers talk, I usually go through these. And I'll keep them quite sort of informal. If you've got any questions at all, then please do just ask me as well. But, um, are you okay? Yeah. Did you check? Ah, uh, there you go. Uh, let's go. Okay, you're all stage ones. Oh, Tommaso's saying yes. How's Tommaso treating you? Yeah, all right. Looks fine, Sophia. All right. Yeah. So this is the these are just the slides that I usually do when I'm at universities, and um, I focus this on people who you know maybe all your knowledge now at the moment is three weeks of training that you've done. Maybe you want a career change, or more of an idea about the type of roles available really in the financial industry. So I'll, I'll forward these on to you as well. There's a bit more information um, on these slides than you thought. Obviously you know who I'm quite trading on by now. Hopefully you know these two. Um, so I'm going to start off just by sort of breaking into the, in the industry, like an overview of the type of roles that are available in the financial industry. So let's have a look. How many of you here are recent graduates or university level? Yeah? 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 <laughs> You guys? No, I just work. Yeah, you just work, graduated. Work, yeah. Work. Yeah. You're all looking to get into the financial industry as well. Yeah. As well. Okay. So, how I like to split this up is obviously everyone starts with okay, what's the most sorts of clients? You get brought on to client meetings. You will be focusing very much on a specific asset class. If you go into a big financial institution, you'll be, I don't know, a bond trader, or you'll be an FX trader, or you'll be um, you know, a rate trader, a government bond trader, a corporate bond trader, an equities trader, you'll focus on one asset class and then sub sections of that asset class as well. So you'll be focusing very much on one thing, you'll know everything about that one asset, you'll know the big... Uh, that is very much on the global market side. So this is what I would consider the public side. Public side. Available knowledge. You're not trading on, well, I hope you're not trading on any private information. I'm not condoning anything there, and I'm not condoning anything there at all. But that is one side of the roles you might find in the bank. The other side is the investment banking division. So these are the traditional banking roles you might find, and these guys will work even longer hours, but they'll work on things like company mergers and acquisitions. If corporate finance modeling, that, that's the type of thing you're really interested in. Looking at company from the ground upwards, seeing, um, okay, is it going to be an acquisition target? Someone want to try and buy them, strike someone want to try and sell them. These type of analyst roles where you really want to work from first principles with a company, maybe to try and help them um, get onto the stock markets as well, take them public, make them go through the initial public offering process. These are also roles that are considered front office, but these will be on the private side. So what I mean by that, a lot of the information is not known to the public. So you will be working on deals that aren't commonly known yet. So those are the, <coughs> I'd say those are the roles which are very much advertised. If you, you know, you do a good quick search being like roles in a bank, you might hear about a sales trader or a market maker. Have you guys done the flow trader simulation? Yes. Yes. So that's the type of things you might find. But there's a lot more other roles that you might find. So you've got ones in the mid office and you've got ones in the back office. Let me just go down to another slide actually, this one here. So the distinction between mid office and back office, I think are very sort of old uh, legacy terminology. These are support functions. The only difference between what you might do in the mid office and back office is your clients in the mid office and back office are other colleagues in the company, whereas at the front office, your clients are other other firms, other individuals, for example. So you might have people who are doing helping doing the trade support 
type of roles. Uh, you might have uh, people in compliance, legal, operations. So these are people who really help the day-to-day -day runnings of the bank. So you might be on the systems, you might buy and sell your futures or, or whatever products you might do in real life. Well, not real life, in a bigger firm, if you're doing uh, millions of dollars worth of trades, it might go through a system, but then the actual processing of moving that much stock from some custodian to the uh, client cell and making sure it's in one bank account to another, um, and all of these operational functionalities will be done by the mid office or the back office as well. So operations definitely is a good one. You good for attention to detail. If you're very project management orientated, this might be something that you're focused on. Uh, shorter working hours. Shorter working hours. There might be some shift work as well, in terms of you might be working um, Hong Kong hours or London hours or American hours from London, for example. And that is a consideration to also take into account. That might suit some people, might not suit others as well. Compliance and legal. If you're interested in regulations, you're interested in actually questioning why is that happening? Why is someone doing this? What's happening? And really, you are at the forefront of the financial industry. It's, a, um, it's really much a growing area in finance. Not only in the big banks, asset managers, hedge funds, but I know for a fact the financial economy authority have increased the amount of job openings that they're doing as well. And you get to learn a lot. So, so they're yeah. most, they're the most lawyers, right? they have No, not necessarily. If you are legal, then you will have to have a background in law. I think you will have to become a solicitor background. But compliance, no, not necessarily from a law background at all. I think they help you go through all of the necessary qualifications that you need to do compliance. I think that's the difference between the two terms. It might differ bank to bank. Compliance, you do not need a background. You don't need to be a lawyer to be in compliance, but I think legal, they do hire lawyers specifically. But one will just help write the legislation of the ethics of a bank, for example, whereas compliance will actually help to investigate issues on an ongoing basis. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Back office, there's a lot of other, a lot of other functionalities that you might not have considered. Technology in finance. I think I have a lot of friends who work in technology and finance, but none of them are from a computer science background. So they get to work on a lot of, I don't know, new products. So a lot of banks these days, I know, for example, ING, Goldman Sachs, are really ramping up their fintech um, projects that they're doing as a bank on their retail banking side and for their wholesale banking side and investment banking. So technology and finance, there's, I would say there's two different roles. So there's technology that might help um, trading systems. So the systems that you use, it might help to support those trading systems as well. You'd be working on managing those. But there's also the new sort of fintech side of things. So I think a lot of people now work on the sort of data science projects, fintech, and things that will help bring new products to the bank as well. So if you're someone that might be a bit more entrepreneurial minded, um, technology and finance might be roles you know, it might be an area that you might actually look at rather than purely just sales and trading or in the investment banking division. Do they do algo trading? Yes. So they do a bit. I think this is very, it depends on the bank. So here I've also got quantitative analytics and risk management. So this really is um, now a, a growing role as well. You might have heard of algorithmic trading. So in bigger institutions, the use of algorithms is to reduce costs to reduce the time um, <coughs> spend, uh, in terms of um, how quick it is to actually get an order filled, executed by the um, centralized exchange, for example. So taking Bank of America as an example, the Merrill Lynch office was in St. Paul's down the road. The Bank of America office was in Canary Wharf down the road. When they merged in London, they chose to move all of their staff to the Merrill Lynch office because it's literally 32 steps away from London Stock Exchange. So the wires underneath is actually a lot shorter to get to the London Stock Exchange than from Canary Wharf to there. Now, that is something that the guys in technology might work out. So if anyone is from a hardware, software, and engineering background and likes that sort of thing, that's where there's a lot of openings there. But not necessarily on that side of things. On the algo trading, there's a lot of uh, electronic trading desks, which might, be, which might come under the front office roles or might come under quantitative analytics. 
So these guys might do electronic trading. So they might write programs and algorithms to just execute orders in one go. They also refers to research as well. So research analysts, I think the distinction between quantitative analytics and research analysts, well, it depends on the asset class. So my flatmate is an IT research analyst, and he still does the same principles of how he models a company as he would do in um, the students of investment fund. So he will he covers a certain sector of equities. Um, he has about 20 companies that he'll go and meet all the CEOs, he'll meet all of the board of directors, think of their views, and then look from their balance sheet, etc. So if you're someone who I would suggest is very, you know, analytical, you like to know more about what you're trading and why you're trading and why exactly did it move this way rather than the other way. Yeah, research is very much an idea generation type of role. So yeah, quantitative analytics does uh, build into it more. I think more of the fixed income currency type of research roles are increasing the use of quantitative analytics and algorithmic trading just because of the scope of um, people using algos on these products rather than uh, maybe other asset classes. So other divisions, I've left the top two to last because these two also are what I consider on the buy side. So you might have heard of hedge funds, asset management firms, private wealth firms, insurance firms. They will all have some sort of assets under management and the idea is to get a return on investment for different customers. So these are, you might, in a lot of big banks, you might have these two divisions, but these top two come under the buy side as well. So you've got the sell side, investment banks, all those roles, you've got the buy side as well, who are usually the clients. Now, what type of roles do you find on the buy side as well? I, I would suggest that when you start off, there's much more of a analyst portfolio manager type role. So again, these are the people who will model certain asset classes and create with, create a portfolio product. They might have 100 million pounds that they have to invest and through whatever modeling purposes they do, they say, okay, 10% might go into equities, 30% might go into bonds, etc. So again, very front office based, it's very client uh, facing as well because you kind of need to know the client's risk appetite, um, the client's needs for why are they investing their money? Are they a 50-year-old about to uh, retire and they want to save for retirement? Or is it a 18-year-old tech entrepreneur that's opened up their first um, savings box? So again, client relationship, uh, team working, you've got a strong interest in markets because you kind of have to have an idea of where you think markets are going in order to make a portfolio out of this. Um, slower rate of progression, I would suggest that not necessarily a slow rate of progression, I think, because sell-side institutions, so your investment banks, it's much more clear and aware about the progress and how many years it takes you to get promoted to the next role, etc. Whereas in asset management, it might it varies very much with what firm you're in as well. Private wealth management, very similar to asset management, where you are helping your clients get a return on their investment. The two differences. When you think of asset management, think of corporations, big companies, big institutions. When you hear the words private wealth, think rich individuals. So people with private wealth man in private wealth management, you'll be working directly with rich individuals who want to uh, you know, get a return on their own investments. Uh, something I have heard in terms of private wealth management, uh, foreign languages are a plus. Uh, most of the, uh, the majority of private wealth uh, firms in Europe sit in Switzerland and Germany, so French and German are definitely a plus for most of them, but there are a lot of wealth management firms, for example Barclays has their own wealth management team, whereby if English is your own, only language then it's absolutely fine. So I've talked a lot about other divisions, um, any questions, I've just sort of given you loads of information about the roles itself as well, is there any questions at this point? How easy is it to move between? Yeah. So, a lot of big firms allow a lot of mobility between movements. So I know a lot of people who started off from operations, from technology, and now are in front office. And I actually know it the other way around. I know a lot of traders who've moved into risk management. 
especially after the financial crisis. So risk management seems to be growing into, you know, there's a lot of money in risk management. So I've seen a lot of people move either way. Obviously, you have to have a, um, a reason why you want to move in that way. Maybe you've trained up as a lawyer, you're in legal, etc. And then um, if you're justifying a certain move, you, it's your own personal why am I doing this? But I know some people who were doing FX operations, for example, and then they moved to become an FX salesperson. So it was a it was a gradual move. But in terms of how easy it is, well, one depends on what job openings are there. If there's if there's a hiring freeze, then it'll be very difficult to. <coughs> in, uh, so that's one. It depends on the timing of the say, like the cycle, the banks. Do you the person? Like, yeah, day? yeah. Usually you get trained by people on the desk okay. as well. Um, or you go and do some training program as well, depending on seniority, I think. In terms of moving, definitely fine. Uh, I, I also know with technology and finance, there's some banks like Goldman Sachs who I think 50% of their graduate intakes are now in technology, as I've heard from some of my friends. Um, but those are really the roles, I'd say, sell side, buy side, very overview, a very big overview on that. Any other questions? I'm confusing anybody. Okay. So I put this slide up because a lot of people have heard of the names of big investment banks. You've heard of Goldman Sachs, maybe Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, Bank of America, UBS. These names are very out there. They've got big recruitment departments that you know put their name out there as well. Now, with asset management, the names might not be as well known. So you might not even know oh, how can I apply to an asset management firm if all I know is BlackRock or Fidelity or some of the big names? But all of these firms that I've just put their logos on, they, will have, they have a hiring process. They've got a careers page online, and this is just a small sample of places that you can have a look online. So if asset management is something that you're really interested in on the buy side, you might be looking at bigger firms to move into, but there's so many out there. For example, of some of the firms that are hiring, I can give you a list of a lot more and what they do specifically. It, but after this, after this uh, session as well, if that is, um, yeah, that's a good for example. What for asset management and applying? Once you've got the okay side, I like the idea of creating a product that will get me a return on investment. How do I know whether I'm going to fit in in firm X rather than firm Y? I think there are, the way that I go about doing this is, one, looking, what are the main business lines? Companies like BlackRock and Fidelity might be, um, you know, they might do, have strategies in everything. They might do fixed income trading, they might do equity trading, etc. They'll have different portfolios. But, for example, FIMCO focus on fixed income rather than equities. Um, State Street are a custodian, for example. So learning and researching what each of these asset managers do is a good way of determining is what my own personal interest is my career suitable for this type of company as well. So I will, for alternate roles in finance, so here are none, some other names as well. Broking and agencies. So a broker and an agency are two other types of sell-side firms. So you might have heard of ICAP, Tullet Preben, BGC, GFI. What the role of a agency or a broker is, is to facilitate the trade between two other counterparties. So just think what a state agent does. They will find a renter or a buyer and someone selling or leasing the house and they will match the two together and they'll get a <coughs> for it. Same thing, if you are a broker, you'll have two maybe market making clients. So you'll have someone who is uh, a trader at Barclays, someone who's a trader at Bank of America, one wants to go long, one wants to go short, and because of your, you know, your connections, you'll match them. Broking is probably the most client-facing role out there, I think, out of any financial role. Out of any financial role, as I'm aware, in my own opinion, they do go out three to four times a week. So if that is in line with your... Uh, the way that you, you want to live as well. Um, just be aware that there is a big going out culture in broking and agencies. But some of the names you might want to look at, if, 
Um, you don't want to take on the pressure of necessarily trading your own book if you know um, you know your own psychology, but you like to be involved with markets and you want to be that sort of broker between two counterparties as well. There's some names, TBI Cap, BGC, GFI, Tradition, there's countless more. There's also definitely very much part of the financial industry as well. You can do some of the roles within, say, corporate finance or what you find in the investment banking division in some of these big four firms as well. Uh, like I said, the regulators, the Financial Product Authority or the PRA, um, a lot of my friends who started off at the Bank of England now work in the PRA as well. Very much a research-based role as well as a client-facing role, but um, if you're interested in the regulatory affairs of the financial industry, there's a lot of roles there as well. Central banking. So if economics is something that you're very interested in, if you're interested in why, uh, how do they actually go about setting interest rates, the forecasting of inflation, uh, GDP, everything to do with macroeconomics, Bank of England or any other central bank is a great place to actually start a career as well. If they give one of the, I, I would, I would argue they give one of the best trainings in the industry um, in terms of macroeconomics and actually understanding how it, how the system all works. Hedge funds on the buy side again, they'll get investors with assets under management in order to make a return on investment. There's roles like portfolio, becoming a portfolio manager, an execution trader. The, the way that most people go about um, entering a hedge fund is starting on the sell side or in a bigger buy side firm and then moving to a hedge fund rather than going directly into a hedge fund. Um, there are some hedge funds now that are starting to open up applications to people that have not worked in a sell side firm. So I know Point72 is an example. Uh, and some of the quantitative firms are also opening up their recruitment process as well. Private equity, again, uh, you're dealing with uh, companies who are not yet on a stock exchange, private market, uh, private companies as well. Uh, ratings agencies, so there's a lot of, um, I would say, data analytics involved in ratings agencies and sales. Um, S&P, Fitch, Moody's, you determine what the rating of a company or a government um, or any sort of supranational institution is as well. And you've also got news agencies. So there's actually a lot of roles available in news agencies as well. Again, you'd be probably doing the same sort of data analytics and news uh, and sort of research that you might be doing at other firms, but you're doing it for the purpose of you know, journalism. You're doing it for the purpose of news, uh, getting news out there into the industry. So Bloomberg, Thomson Reuters, other two big ones. Any questions on that so far? Uh, the the yeah. private equity and hedge funds, is that the same thing, but private equity just deals Private equity, I would say, like... is very much similar to the investment banking division. You will be working a lot um, a lot of mergers and acquisition deals, but these might be for uh, predominantly private, privately owned companies. Whereas in the investment banking division of a bank, you might be dealing with companies who are already public. Okay. Well. So is that less regulated than, than? No, it'll be equally as regulated. Is e oh. Equally as regulated. Yeah, I, I will stress that. I think it's one of the most regulated industries out there as well, but um, shouldn't stop you from applying. But is, is it will be easier to set up a hedge fund than a private equity than like if you wanted to set up? I would say both would be equally as hard to set up. All right. Okay. Right. Any other questions? Is there something you want to tell me about? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I'm interested in, I mean, that's my ultimate goal. I, I'm interested in setting up. Yeah. yeah um, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I will right. put that one out there. I don't know. No, I, just, I just heard hedge funds will be easier, it's less regulated or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I would say a family office or a private trade firm, whereas a hedge fund is regulated because, as a hedge fund, you will have other people managing your money. Yeah. once. You get to find money, you are definitely under the SEA. <coughs> uh, okay, so this is something that I do for a lot of university students. Overview. This is very much aimed at the graduates, so I'll just skip these numbers. That's basically how many how many jobs versus how many applications for Goldman Sachs uh, summer internship. Yeah, two percent. This was back in 2016. Um, but let's go back into this. So. How, how do people feel with interviews, assessment centers, applying for jobs, 
do you guys have you guys had any experience of actually applying to any other firms or is it more of a I don't like this at all? No, I hate I hate interviews and you hate you hate interviews. And tests. Well, I'm just the traditional way to like apply is yeah. obviously I would say do your research online, go onto their careers pages, see what's available, and what you would necessarily need to do is you'll fill out a form, they'll ask you for maybe your qualifications, your employment history, um, references, maybe they might ask you questions about why this bank, why this why they might ask motivational questions as well and then the, you'll get a phone interview interview usually by a member of HR asking you questions like uh, tell me a time when you work as a team, tell me a time when you had to deal with a difficult employee, tell me a time etc and then you'll get an assessment center where again the interview process will go you'll have to do some case studies potentially um, you'll have to do some individual and group presentations and then hopefully an offer but this is a very traditional route and if, if this is only working for 2% of the people applying to these jobs, what other ways are they doing it? And I'm not in any way paid by LinkedIn, but I am a huge advocate of LinkedIn. If you're on a job search, LinkedIn, premium LinkedIn, the jobs functionality on LinkedIn is incredible because once you've got a list of these name of firms, not only can you just search on a job saying, okay, I want to see available jobs at Goldman Sachs, I want to see jobs at ING or uh, I don't know, energy investments, and all of them, they are all usually posted on LinkedIn. It usually has the name of the recruiter, the internal recruiter on these job adverts. What's to stop you from just going on their profile, sending an email, just sending us saying, is this an opening available for someone of my background, etc. So I, I do recommend to a lot of students. They say, oh, I've tried so much, I gave 40 applications in, but no one's seeing my CV, no one's even responding to me. Recruiters on LinkedIn is a very good way to go about doing this. And I can tell you from experience, there are thousands, tens of thousands of recruiters on LinkedIn. And once you start messaging one, they might say, this is not suitable for me, but they might be friends with another recruiter who, they will get commission for the people who they place in a job. So it is in their interest to try and help you get a job especially if you're looking, and especially if you know, okay, maybe I'm working in insurance. Can I just search on LinkedIn? Who, uh, recruiter, insurance, London, and it might even be on their, you know, their job profile on LinkedIn. You've got a certain company in mind. They might have recruiter for X, bank X. And, and the people I have, but do you know what you're letting yourself in for is a good question because you might hear about these roles, you might research about these roles, but if you're expecting to be a trader and be able to walk on desk at 10 a.m. in the morning, then you might have a bit of a shock on your first day, you're told to get in at 5.15 or 6 a.m. every morning. What is the role, like what is the um, hierarchical structure in our firm? And do we have a very flat structure? Is everyone the same? They all report to say the CEO, or have you got a sort of analyst, associate, VP, director? Why are you interested in firm X? This might be a hard one, especially if there's not been any prior experience. Like, why would I want to work at Goldman Sachs rather than JP Morgan? Why would I want to work here rather than there? Talk to people. Talk to me. I know people working at these firms. If you want to know about, oh, I'm applying to Barclays and I'm applying to Goldman Sachs, you know any two people that can tell me about their experiences at this firm? It's a huge amplified alumni as well. As people working at these firms, I can tell you honestly the pro of these firms. If you didn't go, uh, some some jobs do require you to have a university degree, but even if they do, usually they don't really matter. So uh, someone who got hired to the same team as me at Bank of America studied Portuguese. So, and he, he's still there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Portuguese and Russian. My old boss studied law, and the person who sat next to me did history. So, I mean, it, you, you don't necessarily have to come from at all a mathematical background. Maybe if you are doing a technology role that requires a certain coding element or a certain understanding of um, certain technical aspects, then maybe. But it doesn't mean you can't have studied something differently. Does the uni matter to the school of Oxford? I think, so, let's put, so Morgan Stanley worked with us a lot and they have scrapped their requirement of target universities. 
when I was a summer intern at Bank of America, I did not go to Target University. So I studied at Bath. It's now a Target University. But when I was there, it was not a Target University. Um, there are some roles which they definitely do look at certain universities, but a lot of these firms will will look at you. Like, you just you won't get a look at it if you don't make an application. Is how I, I how I tell a lot of people. Um, I would say global markets roles, so your public side of a bank, are look at a wider range of universities or schools rather than the investment banking division side of things. So the private side bit of a stigma of what type of universities you go to. It's gradually getting better, gradually getting better. But I think global market is way better than the private side. That's just my opinion. Other banks might tell you something completely different, but that's my honest opinion there. Um, I say don't worry about what university you went to. Don't worry, don't worry about that at all. Don't worry about the different roles, different routes that you've got there. If they specifically stated on their website, we will only hire from LSE, then okay, fine. But other places, if you don't make an application, then there won't be any chance at all. Um, I, I, I think it should be fine as well, in terms of what? Yeah, in terms of your history. And uh, I don't know if anyone's from a uh, ex-military background as well, but a lot of these financial firms do look at you, especially if you are, had a non-civilian professional history as well. Um, where do you see yourself in five years' time? I personally hate this question, so I don't know where I'm seeing myself next week. I am, that's why I am. I'm just yeah, being yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to be in this office <laughs> or next week. You know, but it, I think how to structure this, where do you see yourself in five years' time is, where do you plan your professional um, break? So if you are, where do you want your professional uh, sort of experience to go? You have some quantitative questions as well. Um, so this is just a gauge, how much do you know about uh, what you're applying to? Uh, the more that you put in your CV, in terms of how much you say you know, the more you're going to get questioned on it. So don't say about something that you don't, because they will probably pick up on that. Uh, quite a lot of people do start off what news article has interested you, and you all have been at Amplify for three weeks now? Mm. You should know something that you can talk about. So, I don't know, a news article. So, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, um, um, I would also, just on that note, we all laugh. A lot of banks have been told they are not allowed to talk about Brexit publicly. So, if you do have any interviews coming up after this, I would refrain from Brexit, in my personal opinion. I was told in an email memo when I was at Bank of America not to mention Brexit in any public way. So in interviews, as much of a very interesting topic as it is, I would refrain from talking about it in a UK financial institution in an interview. And that, that, that would be, that, that's, my, that's my advice as well. Uh, quantitative, again, can I ask you to do a stock pitch if you're applying for an XP's role? So have one prepared, i.e. find a company that interests you. Don't do Apple, don't do Vodafone, don't do one of the big sort of large cap companies. I had, I, my go-to one is, have any of you heard of Pure Capital? Or Pure Surf, or not Pure Capital, Pure, Pure Surf. No. Okay, have any of you heard of Coca-Cola Light? So you remember when they brought out a green can of Coca-Cola? <coughs> so this was around a time when there was a huge scare about aspartame in Coke, uh, Diet Coke, which was linked to cancer, which was linked to all these things. Coca-Cola Life was sweetened by something called Stevia. And Stevia, the largest producer of Stevia, was Pure Circle. So that's how I started my pitch. I, I, there was something that I would, I didn't drink Coca-Cola, my friend did, but I had a product that I use every single day. Can read more about it? Is there something that you buy every single day? Do you go and get a Burley's sandwich every single day? Who are their, who are their suppliers? Is there something, a very interesting story around that? <laughs> So, <laughs> you know, it's just one of those things. You, there's things that you use every day that there might be an interesting story. So I found this AIM stock of Pure, Pure Circle. Had I actually invested in the time that I pitched it, it would have been a very good investment. But don't do any of the obvious ones. Find a personal story behind it as well. Um, if you're applying for more fixed, I'll ask you to do some maths. Uh, so in terms of pricing and bond, about net present value, discount cash flows. If you've not learned that stuff 
uh, I, me or Tommaso or anyone here will be help, willing to help you go through some of the basics here as well. Um, if you're applying for more of a corporate finance in the public side, they might ask you to walk them through an account statement. They might think, okay, you've got a balance sheet, you've got your income statement, walk me through this. Uh, some jobs might require you to do a small coding element as well. So, but not all. Uh, coding is not necessary for all trading jobs. I've been asked that as well. It's useful to know good Excel skills for a lot of these roles, but coding is not a requirement on that statement. Uh, technical versus competencies. Technical again, current market knowledge might talk to you about brain teasers. It might also ask about, they might ask things in a way they might think, I have no idea, but asking for your view. So if I ever asked any of you saying, where do you see cable at the end of 2020? You, of course you have no idea. If you had the right answer, then yes, you're hired. <laughs> but no one knows this answer. They want to see, okay, what do you know about that's affecting the UK economy, what's happening to affect the US economy now? And you could talk about your views. One hand, they could go up to 140 if X, Y, Z happens. However, we might get some parity, hopefully not, if something else happens. And just talk about how you, it's just a way to show your understanding of current market knowledge as well. <coughs> a big question is, what are the biggest regulatory changes in the industry? I think regulation is one of the biggest things that have impacted every single firm in the financial industry. So your favorite thing, is it, no. is it regulated, is it not? One thing I would read up about is the Markets in Financial Instruments Directive, so MIFID II, if this is familiar with all of you. I would have, you don't have, like it's 1.2 million lines long. I don't want to read all of that either, but there's a lot of summaries. I think EY have got a really good summary online just to tell you about the main aims of it. Might ask you some brain teasers. Uh, my favourite one that I used to ask people is how many flights go in and out of Gatwick every day. I don't expect to know the answer. I just want to. All they want to see is how do you think. So talk out loud. It's my advice. Competencies behavioural. Th these are just examples, whether in work or in a sort of extracurricular, personal, other thing that you do. Um, but they want to see how you act in some situations. And these might also include some sort of wanting to see your ethics as well. They might, there was one question now that I've heard Goldman Sachs are asking, you're at the pub on Friday night with the rest of your team, one of your best buddies from school is also there, but he's now a banker working on one of the biggest mergers of 2019. <coughs> he accidentally, he has three pints of beer, he has a lot of vodka shots, and he tells you exactly the time of the merger, he tells you that they're looking at, they tell, he tells you all the informa important information, he you report it. So there's a lot more, not only these tell me a time about leadership, teamwork, when you struggle at work, etc. project based, there's <coughs> many more of these ethics, conduct type questions there as well. Um, I think every single interview I've done, they've asked me something about tell me a time when you struggled uh, with a project, with a teammate, with a colleague. Uh, no matter what type of job you're applying for, financial industry or not, I think it's a good sort of example to have. But don't also use it as a venting board of like, I hated my colleague because of X, Y, Z. Use it about how did you resolve, how did you resolve this? So a few slides up, I mentioned this star. I use this situation, task, action, resolve. So when they ask you a question, what was the situation? Mine with, my, an old one of mine with information taken out. Say the truth. Don't say anything that's a lie. I'll give you an example. Um, anyone here from the West University of Bath? No. So I went to the University of Bath. Did you? I'm from Bath. You're from Bath. Yeah. Well, there's an economic society at Bath. About over a thousand members because it was only a two pound sign up. Now, why they got over a thousand members is in the second week of term, they always organize this huge night out in Bristol where they pay for your club entry, they pay for the coach from Bath to Bristol and back, they pay for like one drink when you got there. So ever, you know, you're a student, 18, 19 year old, you've just got 60 quid for a nice time in Bristol. <coughs> That's how they got 1,000 people. Now, what a lot of students did that I saw that came from the University of Bath, they'll put in there, under their experience, active member of the University of Bath Economic Society. Now, that's not necessarily a lie. They pay their membership and, you know, they might have gone to a couple of socials. But 
saying that they're an active member to me says, you know, they've gone to all the economics talks, they've seen all of the, you know, initial lectures, they are actively involved with the economic society, when in fact all they've done is drink. When I mean the truth, it's not just saying I've got a PhD in computer science when you don't. It's more about don't you can you can embellish it, but don't do it to an extent where it's completely untrue. Now, so this is quite small. This is an example of mine. So one pager. Now, if you are from if you are a recent graduate, I would suggest putting your education section first. If you are not a recent graduate and you've been in the you've been working for I would say over a year. Now these slides are very much tailored towards when I do this session to students, but put your professional experience first. So how do I do this? I put my name in the top. Our colleague Shao, who runs had a CV of someone uh, that he wants to hire. Apparent really good education, really good professional um, background, but the number had 10 digits instead of 11. And like, as many typos as I can spot in line with my eye, I can't spot whether you've made a typo on your contact details. I, I, I don't know whether your mobile number is wrong. So do double check. It's a very easy thing to say, and you all know this, but double check your details at the top right. Um, you do not need a summary in your CV. I see summaries on all the CVs. Like I said, I had 471 CVs to review in a very short space of time. I do not read the summaries. Everyone will say the same thing. They're diligent, they're hardworking, they're eager, they're just, they're just listing a thesaurus to me. For finance, you do not need a summary. So, from your education, do this in reverse chronological order, so do the most recent thing first. And you don't necessarily have to add everything. There'll be some people with loads of experience, loads of experience, whether it's, you know, but make it tailored to what you want to do. So if you want to work in a financial in institution, then you've got Amplify. So you've got all the information that you've done in a financial firm. But on the flip side, don't leave things out if you don't think it's relevant and it's your only experience either. So my first ever job, my uncle owns a printing company. So we would use to get orders of like pens and cups and stuff, and companies would say, can you print our logo on? So my first job, I worked for four days in my, com in my uncle's company. We, have you heard of the company Sipsmith, making vodkas? Yeah. We had 15,000 decanters, and I had to unpack, get into printer, and repack all 15,000 of those. Very mind-numbing work. And I thought that was not relevant at all. But that was actually one of the interview questions I got for someone that I applied. And a lesson that I learned from the person who interviewed me is don't, um, don't assume that what you've done is not relevant because that just shows me that you can do a repetitive task and keep doing it. But for the <coughs> sake of space on a CV, keep it focused as well. So uh, this is a bit, bit cut off. At the bottom, I always put for more information. Uh, see my LinkedIn page where I've got more information. But let's talk about the three individual sections. This is how I like to do my CV, and I think it's very much it's very common in the financial industry as well. So let's start with education, reverse chronological order. So this will include not only school, university, if that's all you, uh, or whatever um, education you've done, whether it's a diploma, whether it's you know professional qualifications, all go on here. I would, I would state where you did it, uh, what was the title of uh, what you did, did you do any extended projects, uh, any big projects, did you get any awards. Um, always put the name of the institution and the name of like, the job role or what you did on the left-hand side, because in the Western world we start reading from left to right. Uh, if you've only got a few seconds to initially judge a CV, do you want the first thing for the person to read is what you did, or do you want the first thing for a person to read is the date in which you did it? So I always left a line where I did something, what was, what was it I did, and I put location and date on the right hand side. So you can do this, and then um, professional experience. Professional experience, 
So again, reverse chronological order, title of company, your job title, and then two to three bullet points of you know some of the responsibilities you have. Just be very factual about what you did, or factual about I made these sales, I um, hit my sales targets by X Y Z, I did X Y Z, rather than using this here. Um, it, an interviewer will be able to see that you are hardworking or you're a team player by the factual things you put about your job in these sections. If you've got two, if you've had two jobs at the same bank or the same firm, I should say, then just put them underneath one another. And something I like to add is a sort of miscellaneous section at the bottom: skills, achievements, and interests. Everyone's had a professional history. Everyone, everyone's had an educational history as well of some sort. But everyone is a different person. I don't want 400 CVs of complete robots. I want to know, like, what things interest you as well. So I always put some interests here. This is a very important section. It gives you some ground for talking as well, and says who you are. It's also a place to add, are you fluent in any other languages? Have you got any technical skills? Have you got any other projects or certifications? Have you got a blog? Have you done anything else that might not fit into your career history, put it here. If it's interesting, it's interesting. And there's nothing that is, you know, I had one student say to me, she, um, one of the interns last year said, I'm a, I do a lot of extreme sports. I go bungee jumping every, every so often. I'm, and she was like, is that relevant sport? And I was like, that's really interesting. That, you know, you're trying to become a bungee jumping instructor or something. Like, I would think that's good. No, that's pretty cool. So if there's anything there, I would add it there as well. Um, Obviously, be sensible about some of the stuff you put on there uh, as well, and um, keep it professional. So that's kind of how I would structure my CV. Three sections with your contact details at the top. I've got a website here, so I usually link my LinkedIn underneath, so people can just um, see more. If you've got your own personal portfolio on a website, you've got a blog. If you, you know, if you contribute to anywhere add it on as well, it's just to show more about you. Why, did, why, why did you put education first? So why did you put it? On this one, so yeah. these set of slides are, yeah. I usually use these for university students. Okay. So what I say is recent graduates put education first, but if you've been working for more than one or two years, put your professional experience first in education underneath. Okay. Don't Any you have to put, put yeah, don't have, you don't have to put details on exactly what you did, like say Amplify Trading or Bank XXX. Like your Some people don't put any details at all. So Some just people say just put their name and their title and just wait for an interview. I personally yeah. like to add one or two lines of some of the responsibilities I did. If your job title, if it's not obvious from the job title of what you do, then it might be worth adding, okay, I did this, you know, I did that. I was working on this project. Um, also, don't put any sensitive or confidential information on your, <coughs> on your professional experience. I'm sure you all know that. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, I've got anything else. Could you, 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 okay. so can I ask right, you a quick right, question? Yeah. Just, yeah. All right. Um, so yeah, you said about like you know professional experience. Like yeah. you said, if you've done a lot of jobs. Yeah, yeah. So you put the, the top three or last three or. How so you, you can put the last three, but it depends like what industries you've done those jobs in, mm -hmm. and like whether it was all finance. Which ones do you think you had the most impact in terms of what you're applying? <coughs> so if you've got a lot of experience tailor it for what jobs you're applying for. So you don't have to always have one CV. You might be applying for a trading role, so you might put the top three that might um, showcase your skills for trading, but then if you're applying for a sales role, you might put other roles. So I tailor it for each application. All right. Any other questions? I did rush through that, so I, I am happy to take any questions you want to email me. So you don't put the dates on the jobs that you've done? Yeah. Is that I put them on the right first, side. Just the I, first one, and then the second one you don't put dates? No, yeah, I do. I just, I just got oh, lazy I, dates okay. on right. this example. Are the technical skills like, purely computer skills, or are there any technical skills? I think for... Skills? Uh, what, sorry, sorry. So is it just computer skills? Is that your yeah. um, I think for finance, I, I've only ever really seen people putting computer skills. But this might also include, okay, what softwares have you used? If it's trading, what software have you used? Not necessarily I can code in this language. It might be, have, are you a computer server? Uh, might be a good place to put things like this. Obviously, in other industries, they might look for 
other technical things related to that industry as well. Is there something specific? But you wouldn't put like interpersonal skills on it. You could if you had a bona fide qualification. Yeah, yeah. To say for like public speaking, you yeah, can yeah, actually yeah. get a professional qualification at a certain level accredited by an institution. Yeah. Then yes, yeah. I would put that. Yeah. And don't forget that's only relevant for if I was doing a sales role, a broking role specific. Yeah. If I was a quant analyst, it doesn't matter. That's not what they want anyway. It's the opposite, actually. I'd be annoying to them. They'd be shut up. <laughs> Concentrate. But yeah. Good for them to know them. Yeah, but you can have interpersonal. But I wouldn't be listing just like. I'd probably yeah. put it under certifications as well. So, for example, let's say you do have that public speaking uh, qualification. I, yeah, extra certifications that you might that might not outside of direct traditional education you could put there as well. Yeah. If you pass a quality of Sorry. If you pass. Uh, you can put that on education, CFA. or you can put it on there. I've seen, I've seen both. I've okay. seen both. Yeah. Oh yeah. If you've done the CFA, that it's always going to be helpful. Yes. Any final questions? Because that helps. Good. All right. Well, I'll leave it there. I'll send these slides over. I'll get Anne to send these slides over as well. Yeah. But okay. I will probably stick around and stay with us for the next hour or so. If you've got any other questions, do let me know. Thank you guys. Cool. All right. Well, let me, while you're all here, let me just bring up LinkedIn because there's a page that I will show you. Um, I know most of you will be on LinkedIn, so if you search Amplify alumni, basically, it'll come up. There's like a private subgroup, so this is not our corporate LinkedIn page. Can I join it? Every one of you, welcome to join it. What we've got here is there's <coughs> you know, 458 members all of previous people who have done an Amplify course. Now, a majority of these will be younger, I'd say, grad, but there are other people on there who've done the career program as well. Um, the benefit of this is really, if you click on that, if you are at the point of fact-finding of what roles is it that you want to do, um, you know, on that slide that Vincent had, she had a picture of Aberdeen yeah. Standard Investments. And so, for example, you found Shen, graduate investment analyst at Aberdeen Standard Investments. So he, I think, did the summer two years ago, and he works there now as a quant analyst. So if you were thinking about that role, or you wanted an inside track about the culture of that firm, XYZ, it's a perfect place. He's just one. Uh, we go through, so he's, at, he's going to Schroeder's, he's at an independent research house, you know, so on and so on. So it's a really good way for you automatically to find what I would classify as all leads to develop your network. So rather than just going, oh, hi, uh, you're Chinese too, so I'm right. So we talk. <laughs> That's a really bad kind of cold call that's that connect on LinkedIn. Whereas if you go, okay, I'm doing a career course at Amplify, and I was told that by Anthony specifically that you, he mentioned your name, I can, I can guarantee you almost with 100% assurance that all, everyone here will help you, or at least respond to your message, because they were all you at some point. So it's in their interest to really help grow it. Um, this group probably goes back about maybe five years. So some of the graduates uh, would have just started, they might be five years into their career now. So they're kind of not senior, they're not junior either. So they'll give you a good insight to different things. Uh, and there's literally, you know, fortunately through our summer training, you know, there's people at JP, there's people at Goldman, there's people everywhere. Um, so it's a really good way to meet them. If you're not from London and you're actually doing this course and you're, you're staying in London, you don't actually live here, I'd actually get cracking on this now. 
And while you're here, why not try and put out a few feelers and meet a few people? Mm. Let's make, make use of being in London. Right? So particularly if you're looking at using Amplify as a bit of a, okay, you might have the objective, well, I want to concentrate on the training, hopefully something can come of that. But then also the accumulation of that experience that inherently comes with actually learning how to trade properly means that that experience you can leverage up if you meet the right people and then work out the industry like Steve's explained, what do you think you want to do? And be a bit more efficient with the way you're approaching it. Um, another thing as well, just to point out now, when you finish this course, I still have these guys, so say like, he's a summer analyst and he's not even graduated yet, so he might have already got a job, he will still come to me before he gets to the next interview and go, and um, I've got an interview for this role, can I come in and talk to you? And I want you to grill me on global macro, just so I'm ready for it. Or I get messages from guys from many years ago, and I'll go, and can you sling me some research about XYZ emerging markets? And I've got an interview that'd be really good to get prepped up. So point being is that you know, in our interest to see these guys succeed, whether trading or getting good jobs, because it reflects back well on us. So we will actively try to help as best as we can in that sense. So make use of that uh, you know, while you're here, but also in the future, don't feel like when it's over, it's over. It's not. And, and definitely start building that. Any, any help that you need on LinkedIn, we'll, we'll, we'll end this session. But I've got some slides that's basically what I would call the dummy's guide. Because I know it's pretty self-explanatory how you should present yourself on LinkedIn. But me, just given the fact that you see my face popping up all, all over the place nowadays, Instagram and all these different things, that I've just gone through a process of kind of a, a section of slides, six or seven slides, about the do's and don'ts. Because you'd be surprised. Over the summer, what I do with the interns is I actually randomly pick people and I get their Instagram account up. And lo and behold, half of them are not private. And most of them, they're semi-naked or have a bottle of vodka, or something. And then they're telling me they want to work in investment banking, and they're applying to jobs not having much success. And it's just yeah, interviewers and recruiters yeah. that have always jobs will search you online. 100% will search Most of them will, because if yeah. you think about, it was very different when I started, because you know an expense account, if you wanted to take clients out, it's like the sky's the limit, whatever they want. Very different nowadays. You can't get away with that type of behavior. You used to call them yeah, like the M&M, the midgets and model parties and all these sorts of stuff. Like that doesn't happen nowadays. Because if you think about what happened as a reaction to the global financial crisis, people in the finance in industry have been demonized. And any chance that the community, i.e. society, gets to make that appearance for finance, they will grab it with both hands. So you've got, you know, you've got to think that if you're all going to work for a big bank, <coughs> their entire reputation on the line, of course they're going to do their due diligence and fact check you online. Facebook, Instagram, these sorts of things. So it's just about being a bit more grown up about it, that's all. Just as an example of that, now if you are working for one of the big corporates, they do really care about the reputational damage that might be done from what you say online. So especially if you've got a public Twitter account, public Instagram, public any sort of social media where you're putting your own view out there, if that is something that they seem detrimental to their reputation, they will take that very seriously. <coughs> and that's usually the bigger corporates rather than the smaller fans. But just do be aware of what you do post. Yeah, not, yeah. not just like pictures getting kissed and stuff like that. No, but like if you're going to have a Twitter account and you're yeah. like saying how wonderful <coughs> it is and we should get rid of the immigrants, all that sort of stuff, which you might have feelings for, I don't know. That, but that, that's better safe than tough, I'm afraid rather than to tell the world about when you're applying for a job yeah. at a major institution. So it's just about being sensible about it, that's all. Uh, but these are all quite obvious, but we can do that in a different session. All right, cool. I'll let you guys crack on then. Thank you, Denzel. No Thank you. Thank you. <coughs>